Welcome back, traders and investors, to Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep, brought to you by MarketFi. I'm your co-host, Joel Alconan, along with Brianna Valeski, and Garrett Cook's going to be joining me on this interview. Blake Morrow, Chief Currency Strategist at Wise Trade. Blake, how you doing on this Thursday morning? I'm doing great, and thanks for having me back, guys. Blake, you're having such a good morning. Did you get some of your money back from FXCM by chance overnight? Uh, news is reporting that there was a cyber attack coming out and there was a small amount of unauthorized wire transfers. I'm only kidding because the company ended up saying that they returned some of those amounts to the customers. But do you have any thoughts on this development as it's coming out? Just any quick opinion on this before we get into some currency pairs here and some other larger information? Well, you know, I, I, well, first of all, I don't, I don't, they're, they're not my broker, uh, so, uh, so I, I don't use them. But I mean, cybersecurity is obviously a big issue, and, uh, and, and now I'm, I'm just extra cautious and watching for drones flying above my home and, <laughs> and office now. So it's really, but no, as far as, as far as uh, that goes, I think what, what my, my clients have been, is that have FXM accounts have been told, just change your password. You know, fortunately, all the money's been returned, and just ch change your password this morning, and um, hopefully they'll avoid that situation the next time around. So then, uh, all right, let's move on then. So let's get over into the into the, um, the JPY, because I kind of want to discuss this. We had Japan's Q3 tank and manufacturing index come out last night. Uh, it came out at a 12, estimates for, for a 13. Manufacturing outlook survey was pretty much in line at a 10. And the all-industry CapEx uh, was actually up. CapEx came in around 10, just shy of 11%. Street was looking for about 8.7%. So what do you think is going to happen? This seems to be signaling that there's going to be more stimulus, but what does this mean for the JPY if there is more stimulus? Well, it's, well, it's interesting that you could say that. Actually, this morning the BOJ was reported via Bloomberg that um, they said that they don't need to do any more stimulus, and that really shook the yen this morning. We, um, you know, everybody everybody thought was that the BOJ is going to initiate some more quantitative easing, expand its balance sheet even more this month. And um, again, it was reported just just about an hour and a half ago that the uh, that the BOJ is not interested in doing that, and so the yen. Um, Strengthened a little bit. Stock market futures came off their highs. That you know, you know as well as I do. You know, the equity markets really love uh, when central banks apply more stimulus or quantitative easing. And I think a lot of traders were short yen in anticipation of this next month of the BOJ. You know, really pushing on the QE button again. Uh, so with that being said, the yen is actually showing some signs of life. And and what I've what I've noticed, uh, especially over the last. Uh, month after we had that, you remember when the Dow was down a thousand points pre-market? Yeah, which day? Um, you know, yeah, well, yeah, you know, <laughs> just about about five weeks ago, or whatever. Uh, the yen strengthened quite aggressively, and and so that that really proved to currency traders and traders all around the globe that the yen still retains that safe haven bid, if you will. So when the market's scared, people flock back to yen because the yen has been so um, so weak. In recent years, I think you got a lot of uh, value buying. You know, people are looking at the yen as being probably a little undervalued at current level. And then on top of that, if the market does become risk averse, you're, you're probably going to get that bid back in the yen. So what we've been seeing, um, even with the stock market, as the stock market's been stabilizing here, the yen is still maintaining a bit of a bid, no matter, even with the stock market, you know, trying to stabilize. So what that suggests to me is if the market comes back under pressure here in the coming weeks, um, that if that if that's the case, especially with seasonality, you know, being in the October November time frame in the stock market, tends to be a little seasonally weaker time for the market. If that happens, the markets come under pressure again. I think the yen could could really benefit from that. So that's uh, that's really what's on my radar right now. And below 119 yen really exposes its own. So, you know, maybe down to the 115, maybe even 110 level in the coming uh, in the coming weeks. All right. Well, let me drill you down then a little further here then on the on the yen because I'm taking a look here and it's it's definitely fallen quite quite drastically since the uh, October 31st collapse back in 2011. But I'm looking at the boost that it's been getting here now. It seems to be trying to get back to the October levels uh, that it was at last year. We had that little hiccup. Uh, it looks like between you know the summer months here through June and July, and now we're back up. Do you expect some sort of return then, maybe back to levels we were seeing in early? You know, or late 2013, early 2014, up around uh, you know, 0 0.01. I'm just looking at the at the futures right now on the thinker swim. Yeah, if you're looking at the futures, what that really translates to uh, with the dollar yen exchange rate is about the 105 level. I don't I, I don't know. That would be a probably a fairly aggressive move, I would think, and and uh, I, I would 
I guess I guess the way I would put it is, I would be scared to know uh, if the if the yen strengthened like that and the dollar yen fell to that to that at, at that that type of rate, what that would correlate to with equities. You know, I I, I don't kind of I kind of don't want to know the answer. If, if the yen strengthened like that, that 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 suggests that the S and P would probably be trading around sixteen seventeen hundred. So I don't. I, I hope that's not to be the case, and I don't think that's going to be the case. But I, I do think that a, a move down to 115 or 110 in, in the dollar yen, which if I pull up the futures on my uh, screen, excuse me, because I don't have that on my screen. I'll have it on there in just a second. Um, if you're looking at the, at the yen futures, that would be like, you know, uh, 9.9, 9, 0.009. Yep. Uh, on on the end future somewhere in that neighborhood thing that I think those are logical areas to target especially being as oversold as the yen is right now so then breaking off from here uh, I, d I did see you had some comments too about um, the British pound I think you were tweeting a, a little bit about it uh, it seemed I, I was taking a look at the chart and we're kind of re-entering it looks like a new channel uh, it looks like if I go back to like the q1 q2 2013 levels uh, that kind of seems to be the base point for the channel and now we're getting back into it so do we this this one spot four eight two lower bound level. Uh, do you see that as a support level for the British pound? What do you see going on there? And then from there, I'm going to kind of get into well, the Swissy. I just didn't want to go right to Swissy. No, thanks, Garrett, and I, and I appreciate you bringing up the pound because the pound is um, first of all, I, I think the pound's caught a lot of traders off guard. You know, a lot of people have been uh, long the cable, uh, expecting the cable to rally because uh, you know the Bank of England, like the FOMC, might raise rates sooner than other central banks are. Um, and what has happened is the cable's actually weakened, not only against the dollar, which you're, you're referencing the pound dollar, but it's really weakened against a lot of cross rates, like the pound New Zealand, the pound Aussie. Those currencies over the last year and a half have been a product of an amazing squeeze. We've seen this amazing move in the cable, or the pound dollar, or the pound, excuse me, against so many different cross rates. And so the, the pound is really showing a lot of weakness, not only against the dollar, but against the other currencies. And so if you go back to the conversation we're having with the yen, the pound yen is actually the one currency that's really on my radar. Because if you look at the pound yen, it's been following this very strong um, trend line, basically straight up since 2012. Uh, and, and since 2012, you know, it's been pretty much straight up and you just, you're, if you're long, if you're not long, you're wrong. Um, we're we're really within about a hundred fifths of of cracking that trend line and really shifting the dynamics of uh, being a very bullish currency to maybe being more of a range bound currency. So, you know, going back to the pound dollar, I don't think 148, 147. I don't think those are unrealistic expectations, especially if the dollar continues to to gain strength against other currencies. Um, but if you take a look at the pound yen, that that the, 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 the lower levels that that could travel to are maybe even a thousand pips lower towards 170 yen, which is not that, and that it's not that far based on how far the currency pair has traveled. It's gone from 120 to almost 200 uh, in recent months. So it, it, a pullback like that, it, it, it's, it's just part of the ebb and flow of the, of the market. Let's keep the flow going then. Why don't we slide over into the Swissy okay. now? So I'm I'm still personally just amazed. We were talking about this last time you were on about the um the strength that this has been having con con against uh, the euro dollar. You know, I was kind of or against um the euro CHF pair. I was kind of amazed at the retracement yeah. that it had after they depegged it. And I'm just looking at the futures on the Swiss franc right now, and it it seems to be kind of staying level. Uh, we had the fall off uh, in October 2011 uh, down to about 1.075 in that range. Uh, we're hanging around 1.05 right now. What's going on with the Swiss franc? Are we going to break below this kind of uh, lower support level that I'm beginning to see around 1.0257? It seems like we're kind of consolidating well, lower here. I'm not sure what's going to happen with this. I appreciate you bringing that up, Garrett. I um, I actually just blogged about the the, the dollar Swiss, uh, the dollar Swiss currency and the Swiss currency just over the weekend, actually. And the Swiss franc is one of those currencies that the Swiss National Bank has their rates. At um, you know they, they basically um, it's at a negative three quarter basis point. So if you park your money over the Swiss National Bank, they're going to charge you for keeping your money there. No institution wants to keep their money there for any extended period of time. So what used to be you know the Swiss franc would, would rally on a safe haven bid. You know people would be scared. They 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 they'd be fearful of 
the European, you know, crisis. They'd be fearful of, uh, you know, events in the Middle East. Anything, anytime they're fearful, they'd buy Swiss francs. Well, the Swiss National Bank has really engineered uh, an environment where it makes it very unprofitable for any institution or any big, large institution or bank to hold any amounts of Swiss franc for safekeeping. They're going to get charged quite a bit of money. And so what you're seeing is every time, like when the Dow was down, you know, the 1,000 points that one morning and the stock market was really under pressure, the Swiss franc caught a bid but it only did it for about a week. And after a week, it reverted right back to where it was. What that suggests is no one wants to hold the Swiss franc at all. And and any any bid that it gets on any type of fear is very short-lived. And so what that's done is that now put it in a very precarious situation, the Swiss franc. It is sitting up against a 20-year, uh, let's see, since 2000, I'm sorry, not 20 years, since 2001, and we're almost 2016, so we're talking about a decade and a half trend line of the, the U.S. dollar Swiss franc to the Swissy, which means basically if we breach parity, which is only a couple hundred pips away, we're probably going to see a big devaluation of the Swiss franc. So as long as we don't, as long as we don't have any, you know, uh, hair raising type of environments for the for the market, you know, if, if we have a, if we have a pullback and it's orderly, you know, and the stock market pulls back a couple percent here and a percent there, which I think is going to be more realistic as we you know uh, pull back a little bit in equities, then the dollar Swiss or the Swiss franc should continue to weaken. The dollar Swiss would go up. The Swiss currency itself, um, you know, the Swiss franc itself would continue to weaken quite dramatically. But like I said, if, if there's a if there's a you know a, a real um, fear event, so a tape bomb that hits the market, uh, the Swiss franc would catch a bid, but it may only be very short term. But I think this is one of those currencies that I myself, I think the Swiss National Bank has has really um, uh, got the market where they want them. They they removed the floor to get the Euro Swiss. You know, basically they couldn't really support that floor anymore. It didn't make any 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 any. Uh, it, it didn't. It didn't make sense financially for the for the Swiss National Bank. But now that they removed the floor, the Euro Swiss actually looks like it wants to, you know, make a run from 110 back to 120 where the floor was. And I think, you know, barring no no crazy events in the market, I think that will probably happen within the next 12 to 18 months. Okay. So well, I got five minutes. We got about five minutes left here. I want to go oh, back to sure. what you were talking about with um, with the, with the safe haven in the Swiss franc. Um, is this? It, it's we, we all tend to view it as a safe haven, but it seems like to take advantage of that would be more of like a big money play. So you were saying that there was like it looked like there were some bids coming into it. People were seeking exposure to the Swiss franc when we were talking about that for you know that that short week there. Would that be a signal yeah. perhaps that? A lot of the movements that we're seeing in FX is pretty much coming from speculators, maybe not like big money guys like George Soros or, you know, some of these other well-known, you know, currency traders that are out there uh, that maybe they're not actually interacting in the market right now. They're they're currently positioned. And most of the movement that we're seeing is really just, you know, kind of speculators, maybe, you know, bigger guys like yourself that are out there, but not necessarily these big, big guys with, you know, billions of dollars that can really, you know, place bets against banks and collapse countries. Right. You know, you know um, yeah, I, I'm definitely not in that category. I'm an independent trader. You know, I, I may be the chief currency strategist of our of our of our group, but I'm I'm just an independent trader. But I I, I look at it not as the Swiss franc is not necessarily a uh, a, a a speculator uh, situation. I actually believe when you're when when you are you know you, you saw the fear in the market size. I mean, institutions. They are just as much humans as we are, you know, as, as individual traders and investors. Um, when the Dow is down a thousand points intraday, and and also keep in mind that it also sold off five, seven hundred points the previous couple of days. Mm-hmm. When the market falls like that, um, you're going to have institutions that, that, you know, fortunately they can move fairly quickly nowadays, uh, fortunately or unfortunately. Due to technology, they can move in and out of positions fairly fairly quickly, and I think a lot of them will buy the Swiss franc, saying, "Well, what if, you know, what if, you know, what if the Dow is down another twenty percent in the next two weeks? I need to have some sort of hedge against my exposure, especially if I'm, I may be over leveraged and, you know, maybe maybe get, maybe getting some margin calls somewhere else. I might have to have 
some exposure in Swiss France, even if it's a short period of time. And and I think it's I think it's institutions that'll move in and out, but they don't want to stick around very long because they know it's a very it's a very unfavorable position for them to hold large positions for an extended period of time, holding the Swiss franc, especially if you're talking about uh, you know, other currencies that have, like if you're talking about the RBA or the, the RBN, RBNZ, if you're talking about the Aussie Swiss or the New Zealand Swiss, you got a differential of two and a half, three and a half percent um, that you're going to be paying because some of those <laughs> some of those central banks have their rates over to you know two to three percent. So I think that they they can move fairly short term and 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 they can they can move pretty aggressively. But what that really suggest to me, Bill Garrett, is that that's if that move that's so short term, the big push is the big overarching theme is I don't want to own Swiss francs. And there's no reason for an institution to own Swiss francs right now. So that's why the, these these pullbacks are so they're, they're bought up pretty quick and they don't last very long. So is, is it speculators? Maybe. Is it, uh, it, I think, is it some institutional, you know, buying a Swiss franc? I think so. But I think the overarching theme is the trend is changing. We've seen um, the Swiss franc be a very safe haven bid for many, many years. I mean, you're talking for uh, over a decade. And I think you're seeing that trend shift quite dramatically mm-hmm. in recent months. One more real quick, Blake. While we just got one minute left, what, are you, what what's your takes on, sure. on on Brazil? We got we got a whole bunch of news coming out. Uh, they're struggling over there. The central banks out this morning talking about um, contagion. They're going to be able to hold everything. They're not expecting any problem with the banking system. What do you think of the Brazil real? Is it a buy or a sell, or what do you think? Well, the the real, um, I think short term, and we we've been talking about this over the last week. We we saw a lot of false breakdowns with. The peso, the the South African rand, the Turkish lira, the the Brazilian real, we all lump them into emerging market currencies, so to speak. Uh, I think that that for right now, near term, the Brazilian real looks like it can bounce, and as long as stocks hold up and they don't, you know, have a tremendous breakdown, I think you're 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 going to see emerging market currencies bounce here. But I think overall, Garrett, I I I don't think I'd be a I haven't seen anything technically that suggests that the Brazilian real is ready to really turn, but you know, no one ever does. It it it, it just kind of happens, and then it starts setting lower, you know, higher lows, and then all of a sudden everybody goes, "Oh, yeah, the Brazilian real looks like it's going to turn." I tra- technically haven't seen that yet, but the false breakdowns that we saw on those emerging market currencies just over the last week, I think, suggest that they that they might bounce a little bit here. But long term, I think the jury's still out. I think they do have a lot of problems there in Brazil. Uh, Canadian dollar. Any thinks? Uh, any thoughts on that versus the U.S. dollar over the next six months? Uh, well, well, Joel, the the U.S. dollar Canadian or the Canadian dollar rather, uh, it just hit a major technical milestone. I tweeted about it actually three three days ago. It came within twenty pips, which is, you know, you know, less than a fifth. Of, it's about a fifth of a penny from a multi multi year multi month. Um, we call it a big golden fib ratio that it just it came within 20 pips of, and it's it's already backed off 200 pips since then. That means the the Canadian currency has already started to bounce. I, I really think as long as crude oil stays below 50, I think the Canadian is probably going to be a good short. I just think near term it, it it's it's finding a bid, and I think near term it it has room to actually bounce. It's kind of like the emerging market currencies as well. Okay, we've been on the line with Blake Morrow, Chief of Currency Strategist at Wise Trade. Blake, great information as always. Thanks for coming on. We'll speak to you again soon. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.